great, 40 days to go. <laughs> so I want to introduce our speakers. We, um, we have, we're lucky enough to have two representatives from the Vermont um, Astronomical, Astronomical Society. We have Jack St. Louis, who's going to speak, but he's got laryngitis, so he's only going to speak briefly. And then we're going to have, Jack is the president of the society, and Terry is, is the treasurer, so we get to hear from them both. And they even brought some solar eclipse glasses. I don't know if it's enough for everybody, but there's some to give away as well. So I'll tell you a little bit about Jack St. Louis. Um, he's going to give an overview, he and Terry, about the eclipse and explain why eclipses happen, the timing, and how to view it safely. I also asked them to cover, what do we do if it's cloudy? <laughs> So Jack is president, he's active in the group's outreach and astronomical education, public star parties, and unstructured structuring club observations. He's retired from the University of Vermont, worked in computer services. He has viewed several partial solar eclipses, but not yet a total eclipse, and neither has Terry. I got to view a solar one in 1972. <laughs> I was a youngin' then. Not that young. <laughs> Okay, um, that was on Prince Edward Island. Terry Zittrich, Zittrich? Yes. Yeah. is treasurer of the uh, Vermont Astronomical Society, a longtime Vermonter, been here for 43 years, came to be an electrical engineer at IBM. She recently retired and she has three sons that are all living in Vermont, lucky her. Welcome to both places. This is so cool. Look at all the people. Yeah, so I uh, got this great case of laryngitis going on, so it could be terrible if I try to talk today. So Terry agreed to, to do the presentation. And it be fine. Um, as you can see by our logo, we started in 1964. On May 6th, we'll, be, we'll turn 60. It's the same date that the club started, so it's kind of pretty cool. So I've been president for, well, too long. So I think you may be looking at a new president. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Um, so the club is, uh, we, we're active as, we have an observatory in Heinsberg that uh, the club members built and use that as often as we can. And we love to do outreach. And, and we, we go anywhere people can, if they uh, ask us, well, well, schools, libraries, we, we put on presentations. We, talk about astronomy, telescope, telescope making, and just looking at the, the sky at night. And during the day, if you have the proper equipment. Um, for those of you who do not have a viewer, for 50 bucks, no, for free, <laughs> I have about 100 of these, so I may not go around to everybody, but um, we got the cards because it's easy to use. You just put it, look up, and you can share it, and you don't have to try and wrap it around your head or any of that stuff. So it's got a logo on it, and uh, and uh, I'm glad to hand them out. So um, enough of me. So Terry's uh, up to do the presentation. Okay. Hopefully, I won't make too much noise here. I'm going to take this off because yeah, I. I I don't stand still, so. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for coming out and, uh, and listening to us today talk about uh, the upcoming solar eclipse. I'm gonna warn you up front, I just saw this presentation for the first time yesterday. So I wasn't, uh, I wasn't planning on presenting today, but Jack uh, has, has laryngitis, as he said. I went to one that we did this morning, so another gentleman in the club uh, presented this morning in Milton and it went really well, and I watched that, so uh, that was my, uh, my learn session, so this is my do, so, um, so no report cards at the end. <laughs> so, um, as Jack said, uh, we're part of the Vermont Astronomical Society. We have monthly meetings the first Monday of every month. Public is, you don't have to be a member to attend our meetings. Our meetings are held in person in Essex Junction at the library and uh, online uh, via Zoom. 
So since the pandemic, we started Zoom meetings and uh, anybody can attend. So if there's a subject that you're interested in, you can see that on vtastro.org. And that, uh, that's our website address and the viewers have that on the viewer. So that information's on the viewer. So if you see something you like from our agenda and our schedule, uh, feel free to join our Zoom sessions and uh, come listen to us uh, talk about uh, some astronomical uh, subject. So, onward. So today, um, we're gonna talk about sun stuff. And, uh, you know, a variety of sun things. We're not gonna go very deep. I I'm, a, I'm an electrical engineer, not a solar engineer <laughs> or astrophysicist, and uh, what I do mostly is uh, astrophotography. So I do a lot of photography of lots of faint, fuzzy things in the sky. So that's my thing, but I also take pictures of the sun. So I'm hoping, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, and uh, I'm gonna stay very positive about having uh, clear weather on April 8th, at least from two o'clock to four o'clock. So um, the rest of the day, I don't care, but between two and four, I'm hoping it's going to be very clear and uh, we have a great showing. So um, we're gonna talk about the eclipse timing. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why eclipses happen and why they are so scarce. You know, they don't happen that frequently. Um, in fact, for a particular place on Earth, for instance, having a full solar eclipse happen, um, say, over Montpelier, it's very infrequent. Um, and we'll talk about exactly what that timing is. And we're gonna talk about where to look. And also, um, what to expect. And lastly, we're gonna talk about um, safe solar viewing. You know, it's very dangerous to look at the sun, even though you might not feel it when you're looking at it, you're harming your eyes. So uh, Jack brought some of those viewers with him, and uh, we all want people to do safe solar viewing. Okay, so first, let's, uh, let's take a look at the sun itself, and I will see if my little uh, pointer here works. There, oh yeah. So um, here's the different, you know, the sun's made up of a bunch of different layers and all the, the real action, all the real action occurs in the very core of the sun. And the core of the sun's only about 10% the diameter of the entire sun. So it's only about, it's less than 90,000 miles across, which is of course a lot bigger than the earth, which is only 8,000 miles across. But it's 90,000 miles across, and that's where fusion occurs. So fusion occurs deep down in the sun, you know, uh, with all the uh, gravitational forces for all that mass. It's squishing that material, those hydrogen atoms together at such force, they're fusing together. And when they fuse, they create helium, the next element on the chart. And with that process, they also give off energy and heat. And that energy uh, and heat goes through this next layer called the, uh, uh, I believe, the radiation zone. And it takes, believe it or not, it takes millions of years for that heat and energy to go through this zone. The sun is that big. The whole sun is about 865,000 miles across. So over 100 times uh, larger in diameter than our Earth. But in area, I, I believe it's more than a million times. Um, so, uh, so you've got the, uh, the core where fusion is happening. It's creating all of that extra energy as a result of that chemical process, that fusion process. That heat and energy and radiation is slowly going through this um, radiation zone. Then it hits something called the convection zone. So this is where that energy finally goes through the last layer of that uh, part of the sun, gets to what we would call the, the, the surface or the photosphere, gets to the top and then cools down a little bit and falls back down and it kind of goes into a circular radiation pattern, kind of like when you're heating a room, you know, the heat rises and it kind of convects, it kind of circulates around the room so that you get all these little convection zones all over and they, and they create some, and you'll see in a moment, they create some um, surface feature 
that we can see. And you can actually see that surface feature in white light if you have a big enough telescope. In fact, I was just looking at them and taking pictures of them yesterday. So yesterday we had some sunshine for part of the day, and uh, I, was, uh, I was taking pictures of that and the sunspots. So you could see those zones. Um, and then after that, uh, that uh, convection zone, you have the photosphere, and that's what you see in white light. So if you have your uh, solar glasses on or a sol solar filter on a telescope, you can see that, what, what's called the, the photosphere. And then after the photosphere, which is a fairly thin level, I want to say that's only about 250 miles thick. That's a fairly thin layer uh, uh, of the sun. Um, then you have something called the chromosphere, which is, I think, about 1,000 miles. So a lot of action happens in the chromosphere. That's where you see things like prominences. So if you see pictures of the sun, the prominences are created in that area. And then you have this area here called the corona, which is several diameters uh, of the sun wide. So when you take pictures of, like, for instance, a full, and we'll, we'll talk more about it later, but of a full eclipse, like we're going to have uh, coming over Vermont, um, that chromosphere area, so this would be one solar di you know, diameter out here, another one here, you know, you might have the, the, the area would be very large in terms of that, um, the corona. And that corona is also, um, it's representing, you know, the, the particles, um, electrons, photons, that are being pushed off, um, off of the sun. And it's part of something called the solar wind. And uh, I'm sure everybody's heard about things like uh, coronal mass ejections and things that cause, uh, you know, radio blackouts. Or and we'll talk about more of that in a minute. But uh, that's when they have very large prominences that push off these large amounts of uh, of charged particles off of the sun. And when they're pointed directly at Earth, they can cause problems for us. In fact, and they can cause beautiful things as well. They actually are what causes the uh, the uh, the borealis. So the aurora borealis, so uh, some beautiful sights for us as well. So enough on the sun, on this part of the sun. And then, of course, whoops, one more thing. We have, uh, we have the sunspots, which are on the, uh, on the photosphere. So um, talking about those areas, those small convection zones, these little things here you can see when you look at the photosphere layer of the sun, that's the, the, the white light visible layer, those little areas are the size of Texas. So those convection zones are quite large. Um, and they go, they go well into the sun in that, conve in that convection layer. So where it's a little darker here, that's where the gas has cooled. And here is it bubbling up. Uh, when it's warmer. And we'll see a picture of the whole sun here in a minute. You'll see what this, uh, what this looks like. And there you go. So this is what you see when you look through a high-powered telescope at the photosphere. You see all these little, you know, it almost looks like a cracked pavement or a, a peanut brittle. I don't know. I'm trying to think of what this looks like. but. Uh, you know, here's the, the hotter portions of those convection zones, and here's the cooler areas. And these are, you know, these are going deep into the sun, these convection layers, and just basically um, uh, rolling over, you know, hot, you know, they, they heat up, they come to the surface, and they cool down, and they go back down, and then they, they of course, heat up again. So here's a picture of, uh, and this is basically what I was seeing yesterday. I was looking in white light yesterday, and uh, I could see this, the, the uh, and this is colored, of course, but uh, uh, my filter was actually white. So you see kind of, it was just a, a, a monotonic, if you will, um, um, view when looking at the sun. But uh, I could see the sunspots. I was looking at the photosphere. This little um, modeling on here, those are the convection zones. 
a higher, a higher power telescope would show more detail in those convection zones, but that's essentially what, uh, what I was looking at yesterday. And here is a high power uh, photograph of, uh, of the same thing again. Sunspots, um, those convection zones, which are very interesting. And you'll note um, how the sunspots look fuzzy. So they look like they got hairs on them. You know, they look like little gorilla heads, if you will. And, uh, or, or pom-poms, maybe, is a better uh, analogy. And uh, you know, a lot of the time, or most of the time, they come in pairs. Because they're actually, you know, some of this is created by magnetism. There are magnetic fields around those sunspots, like the core of the Earth, the circulating core of the Earth creates a magnetic field. These create magnetic fields, and the sun is just one giant ball of very complex, changing magnetic fields, which you'll see in a second. But um, these sunspots usually come in pairs, and these are magnetic field lines, and they're showing material being carried by those magnetic field lines um, uh, on the surface. And, and a lot of the time when you look at these on the edge of a limb, you'll see those field lines jumping up between various sunspots carrying that material, and we can see it visually. Usually we can see it visually with something called a hydrogen alpha filter. We have to use special filtering to see those things. You wouldn't necessarily see um, the material jumping up over the surface with white light. You'd need a, a special filter for that. But my guess is wherever you're doing your viewing, and whether it's in Montpelier, and I would suggest going farther north, because Montpelier is going to have a pretty short eclipse. They're right on the edge, close to the edge of the full eclipse um, path. So if you have friends farther north, I'd go invite yourself for you know, uh, a lunch and dinner at your friend's house farther north to see if you can, uh, unless of course it's going to be cloudy north and you're going to have it clear. So some full eclipse is better than no, sol you know, no full solar ecl eclipse. So Two minutes versus four minutes, basically. Yeah, we get about, I think the maximum in Vermont is going to be about three and a half, and that's up in the islands. Burlington's around 310. And I'll, you know, I'll talk, I have a map that shows this a little better. And uh, uh, I want to say just north of um, uh, Middlebury, that's the southernmost line. So in Middlebury, you're not going to see a full, it would only be partial. And by the way, a 99% partial is nothing like a full eclipse. So a 99% partial is not a 99% experience, it's a 1% experience. So you, you really wanna, that's, that's what I've heard from everybody, and I have not seen a full, um, but I've heard from everybody that I've talked to, you don't wanna miss the full. So the partial is not the same. I just attended an annular eclipse in El Dorado, Texas. Oh. Question. Uh, Jade Pasikoff was a very much a famous uh, solar eclipse observer. He was a professor at Williams. He passed away a few years ago. He said the difference between a 99%, you know, what's it, the 1% of the sun showing and a 100% total solar eclipse is like the difference between taking your kids, putting them in the car, driving down to Orlando, Florida, and going to the Disneyland parking lot coming home <laughs> <laughs> going into Disneyland. Oh. Perfect. Per perfect example. The, 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 uh, the example given is that uh, the difference between a 99% eclipse and a full solar eclipse in, and being the 99% solar eclipse is like driving your kids all the way down to Orlando to Disney World getting to the parking lot and turning around and going home <laughs> versus enjoying the wonders of, uh, of Disneyland or Disney World. So, and that's, that's basically what I've heard. You want, to, you want to see the whole thing if at all possible. So, and the great thing is, is that everybody, you know, if we, if we have clear skies, which we will, um, um, <laughs> You know, everybody gets to be an astronomer that day, and, and the other great thing is you don't have to stay up late for it. So it's right in the middle of the day. So uh, hopefully everybody can be an astronomer for those few minutes. 
So here's a, uh, an example of the size of the Earth versus the size of the Sun. And that is about, I believe the diameter of the Earth is approximately 8,000 miles and the Sun is about 865,000 miles um, across. So it's about 100 times uh, the diameter. So. And just, uh, just to give you an idea, you know, this, this magnet, this horseshoe magnet here, you know, the field lines, this is exactly what you see when you look at a sunspot pair in terms of the material being ejected and, uh, and pulled across from one pole to the other on the sun. It's very neat to see, and it changes very fast. So these field lines are amazingly dynamic. Even in the process of me taking a, a, a few photos, they are changing. So it's very cool to watch, and you can do time-lapse photography of this kind of stuff. So um, it's, uh, it's very interesting. And here is another image. Um, so again, showing the convection zones. You know, the photosphere up here, the sunspot areas, which are a little cooler. But when I say cooler, they're 7,600 degrees, or I'm sorry, they're 4,500 degrees to the photospheres, 7,600 to about 10,000 degrees is the photosphere. The, the neat thing about the sun is that there's something out here, you know, this thing called the corona that you can never really see unless you have a full eclipse. You can't see it with a 99% eclipse or a 99.9. .9. It has to be 100% eclipsed because it's so dim. But the, the corona is about a million degrees. So it's much hotter, and this is one of those mysteries of science. They, I'll say they really haven't figured that out yet. There have been a few things lately published where they have a theory as to why the corona um, is a million degrees and hotter than the actual surface of the sun. But they haven't necessarily proved it yet, so they're still, you know, trying to understand whether this is the right theory or not. But, uh, but that's a fact. The the corona is actually much, much hotter than the surface of the sun. Now, 76 degrees is more than a hot day in Florida, so uh, it would be uh, it would be pretty hot, as would the sunspots. So, um, so the rest of the sun is also uh, pretty darn hot. So here's a picture of, uh, of the magnetic fields at a point in time, and like I said, they're very dynamic on the sun. So lots is happening uh, uh, from a magnetics perspective uh, with all that swirling gas um, um, inside of uh, and convecting in the sun. And here is just a 400 years of sunspot observation. So, my understanding is that there's a cycle to sunspots, and we recently hit a minimum. In fact, I bought a solar telescope, and it was in the middle of a minimum. And I, I kind of figured out why there were so many solar telescopes for sale. And they were going cheap, because there were no sunspots. There were literally almost no sunspots on the sun. The sun was basically clear. Now, with a big telescope, you can look down, and you can see that you can still see the um, convection zones. You can see that modeling on the surface, but no sunspots. So it was, and you could, and there were some prominences, but very little. It was very quiet. But that ramped up significantly, and now we have a very, very active um, sunpot, sunspot situation. And uh, uh, in fact, it's more act, it's much more active than they were predicting. So, um, and we're peaking faster than they predict. So. So this current cycle is very positive uh, for sunspots. And also says something about the energy the Earth is getting. So, and um, again, this is the first time I heard this this morning, so uh, bear, bear with me a little bit. But uh, so they've been keeping track of, of this activity for, you know, since the 1600s, um, the solar activity. And this, this was a minimal sunspot uh, period. And according to, I guess, records, the Earth was a little cooler then as well. And um, there is some correlation then between sunspot activity and energy being delivered to the Earth. 
So again, I'm not an expert on this, but this is something I just uh, I just uh, heard about this morning, so I haven't studied up on it myself, so I don't ask me a lot of deep questions here. Um, but uh, we do have this uh, cyclical nature of sunspots. Again, it's an 11-year cycle, and you get minimums, you know, maximums and minimums every 11 years. And then, of course, this uh, uh, Maunder minimum here uh, uh, was a very low uh, point and uh, also a very chilly point, I guess, in, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the Earth. And right now we're enjoying, I guess in the, in the 50s to 2000s, we were enjoying a, a nice maximum, and I think we're enjoying a pretty nice maximum right now. In terms of uh, you know, the spectrum of light uh, that we see uh, from the sun, so when you shine light, white light through a prism, you basically get a rainbow of color. So, and the rainbow represents you know, the different wavelengths of light. So at the very short, you have the purple, and the very long wavelengths, you have the red. And uh, I don't know if there's a lot more I'm gonna talk about here. You know, we, you know, as astronomers, and you know, Jack and I are amateur astronomers, we look at that, uh, I talked earlier about seeing this, the sun in um, hydrogen alpha light, it's a particular wavelength, I think it's 656 point something, 0.3 maybe, uh, nanometers, and uh, you know, we can see certain things. We can see uh, this hydrogen alpha emission, which are what prominences are, and a lot of uh, solar activity filaments uh, on, the, on the sun in the chromosphere. And we can look at that with these special telescopes. From, so, so from that perspective, understanding the different wavelengths of light um, emitted by the sun is, uh, is, um, is inter interesting for us. And there it is, uh, 656.3 nanometers is the hydrogen alpha emission line, and you can understand the, the, uh, the sun is in a hydrogen burning phase, which means it's consuming an enormous amounts of hydrogen and creating helium. And it will be doing that for quite a long time, some billions of years, uh, more. And in fact, here is a picture of the sun. So when I look through a hydrogen um, alpha telescope, this is more like what I see. I can see things like, and you can see things like prominences, uh, filaments. Uh, filaments are nothing more than prominences on the face of the sun when you're looking at the face. So, um, and things called plages and, and all kinds of uh, of, uh, of activity uh, on the sun. It's a very interesting and it's very dynamic. And if uh, where you're viewing, wherever you're viewing the eclipse, I have no doubt somebody will be around with a solar telescope. So um, even before, you know, probably before the, 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 full, uh, uh, the full eclipse, it would be a great time to look through somebody's solar telescope. During full totality, if it's clear, you know, when it's gonna be clear out, you should be looking at the, the full solar eclipse and forget about the solar, because you can look at that at any time. Okay, here's some of those. Uh, you can see the, you know, what look like the two poles of magnets. That's probably a sunspot group. And there's some material uh, being pulled between uh, two sunspot areas, and they're like poles on a magnet. And here's something, so this is when you have a giant ejection of material uh, uh, from the sun. So this, this white circle represents the, uh, the diameter of the sun. This is just an occulting disk, so they do this so they can actually see that, uh, that, that ejection. If you didn't put that disk there, the exposure would be so bright you couldn't see the rest. It's kind of like what happens when we're looking at a, a total solar eclipse because you can never see the corona because the rest of the sun is too bright. And uh, this allows you to see that what's called the, these giant prominences and ejections of material are called coronal mass ejections. And clearly when we're looking at it from this direction, it's probably not aimed at the Earth, which is a good thing because it's high energy particles, they're being ejected and flung into space as the solar wind, and when these things happen, the solar wind is very strong from a, 
from an uh, electrical energy perspective. You're, you're shooting electrons, uh, uh, mass and numbers of uh, high energy particles into, uh, into space, and when those things hit the Earth, they interact with our magnetic field, and they come through and they can do disruptions to various things. So we've had a few big events in, uh, in recorded history. You know, we haven't been using electricity all that long. Uh, but in 1859, um, a coronal mass ejection hit the Earth's magnetic field. And at that time, the only thing people were really using electricity for were telegraphs. So these energized telegraph wires and electrocuted people caused, uh, caused fires in the telegraph offices. And in fact, this is what's been recorded, is that some operators, after disconnecting, after this is happening, that you know, the telegraph operators disconnected their batteries to save their systems, they could use the telegraph without the batteries. There was so much energy supplied by the sun put into those systems. And this, uh, this event was called the Carrington event. And uh, I'm assuming this gentleman, Carrington, uh, um, was a scientist who explained what happened to all the people uh, after this occurred. And uh, the next one is the Great Quebec Blackout. Now, I wasn't around for, well, actually, no, I was around. It was 1989, so March, 9, March 13th, 1989, I was actually in Vermont. So I was uh, nine years in Vermont, a CME hit, uh, hit the Earth's magnetic field, and 90 seconds later, I guess the Quebec power grid went out. Now, I know I was alive then. Some of you may have been alive then, too, so you might have, uh, you might have actually experienced that or remember that. I actually don't remember it, but uh, evidently the, uh, um, it caused a nine-hour blackout in, uh, in 1989. I remember the earthquake. I remember the earthquake happening. I guess I don't remember the blackout. And that was, again, caused by a, uh, a powerful uh, coronal mass ejection. OK, so now we're getting to the meat of the, uh, so that was a little bit about the sun. Um, so now we're getting to something about the eclipse. So you know, we're going to enjoy a total solar eclipse here in Vermont. It's going to be clear. It's going to start at 2.14 PM. And the partial portion will last about an hour and 12 minutes. So. Um, I would enjoy that, you know, look through people's scopes. Um, you can do all kinds of cool things to see that, including, you know, wearing, you, during this period, you have to wear some eye protection if you're gonna look towards the sun, but you can do a lot of indirect things. Any, any pinhole or hole, uh, you know, if we had leaves in the trees, I'd say look, look below trees because all those little gaps between the leaves and the trees will project like a pinhole camera on the ground, and you'll see crescents during the, the partial phase. But we might not have leaves by then. My guess is probably not. Um, you can use a colander. You can poke a bunch of holes in a piece of cardboard. But you can do a lot of things to make a pinhole uh, projector, if you will. And that will project it under the ground. Um, but that'll last an hour and 12 minutes at the start. Totality only lasts for. In Vermont, the longest will be three and a half minutes. And like I said, that's up in the islands, Swanton. Uh, everything below will be a little bit less. And that will go to just about uh, almost to Middlebury, not quite uh, Middlebury. Um, did I say? Yeah, Middlebury. And uh, um, Burlington is about three minutes. So uh, about halfway down from the center, you get to Burlington. Three minutes, three minutes and 10 seconds or so. Um, and that's the time you can take your glasses off. No glasses are needed during totality. It's about as bright as a, it's about as bright as a full moon. In fact, if you left your glasses on or your protection on during totality, you won't see anything. It's not bright enough to get through that filter. That filter uh, filters very strong light that's coming from the uh, visible sun. And then after that, you've got another hour and seven minutes of the partial eclipse leaving. So that's the, the moon continuing to go across, um, go across the sun. And you know, this whole thing is accelerating. So that's why the, the leaving is a little faster than the coming, because it's accelerating. 
and I'll talk more about that in just a minute. So, and the partial ends about 4.36. That would be daylight savings time um, uh, on April 8th. So here's the, the entire path, and it starts, sorry, I'm, I'm, I got my screen. <laughs> so tell me if I'm blocking the view. Um, so the path starts here down in uh, Mexico, and I know some people actually going to the town that's right on the shore of, uh, of the Mexican peninsula there. And, uh, and uh, I actually know people all through the path here that are going to be traveling for that, so lucky them. Um, but it travels up, and it actually starts, I, I want to say that the eclipse is about four and a half minutes down here. So that so the, the, it's actually traveling a bit slower. So um, so the so the moon it's it's geometry. It's got to do with the curvature of the Earth, and uh, and as the Earth is curving away farther north, uh, that shadow is accelerating. So down here again, it's it's uh, I want to say it's traveling about fifteen hundred miles an hour. I think by the time it leaves. North America, I want to say it's traveling about 4,500 miles an hour. I want to say, I, I think that's, a, it's somewhere later in the slides. So passing through quite a few states, it's a, it's a great time. But you know, the whole path here, this path is only 115 miles wide. So it's fairly narrow. So it's, uh, you've got to, and you know, you can just imagine, there's a lot of people that live in these areas they're going to be heading into that. A lot of people who are interested in this kind of thing, which, which are a lot of people, uh, will be heading into those areas. We expect an influx of people in Vermont. So, in fact, we, we, uh, we tried notifying the, we actually sent a letter to, uh, to Phil Scott, yeah. like a year ago, yeah. yeah, warning him of this, of uh, what was going to happen and in getting prepared. hand since I haven't been to one that um, the traffic right after the eclipse is horrendous in fact uh, one of uh, the people the person that did the, the presentation this morning in Milton had been to one um, I want to say in Illinois, Illinois or Tennessee I forget which one I think it was Illinois and uh, and this was in 2017 and he said it took him uh, Three hours to go ten miles, and then they got off the expressway. They, 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 they escaped and, and did something else for a bit. So I don't know if it'll be like that in Vermont, but it could be. So I would stay off the big roads or try not to get anywhere right away. Stay put for a bit. Oh yeah. Um, this chart. So from blue line at the top to blue line at the bottom, all of that band will will get a full eclipse. Is that right? That is correct. So, but let me ex maybe maybe I explain it. So the the way to think of this this full eclipse area is that there is a shadow that's a circle that's the shape of the moon, right? So that moon shaped shadow, and we'll have more pictures, but that moon shaped shadow is moving across at a fairly good clip. You can think of it on the edges. You're only getting a small arc. And in fact, at the very edge, you're just getting a, you know, you could be just seconds of, of totality. In the center, the center is going to give you the longest time, right? The, you know, in Vermont, it's going to be about three minutes and, and 30 seconds. Um, I guess we're, we're up in here um, of, of full eclipse. So you don't want to be at the very edge. So. Um, I think Montpelier, and I do have a map here um, that we've drawn out the, the eclipse area. And if I look at it, um, Montpelier is between the two minute and no eclipse line. So it's between, you know, you think of this as the, this area here as the, the happy area for the eclipse. This is the sad area for the eclipse. You want to be in, you want to be in the happy area. Montpelier is in the happy area, but it's just inside. So it's going to be less than two minutes, you know, a minute and something uh, long. So 
But again, any full eclipse is better than no full eclipse. So uh, try to take advantage of it and be an astronomer on, uh, on April 8th. Oops. Okay, here's a, again a more detailed. So just to be clear, this is the bottom edge. This is the center line. So all of this is gonna be really good here. So, you know, Montpelier is inside. Middlebury is kind of on the edge. Burlington is very well placed. So hopefully all the people in Burlington don't need to travel anywhere. You just need a good view of, you just need a good view of the sky. You don't want to be in the middle of a forest. Oh, uh, you mean all up and down? What are, what are the Eastern, they represent Canada, Eastern townships? Oh, uh, Quebec, I see, okay. Yep, yep. All through here, yeah. Montreal is up there, and they're gonna be near the center line. I heard that all the hotels in St. Albans are booked. I bet, yes, yeah. To St. Albans, or? Wow, wow. It could be busy, yeah, it could be exciting. Uh, you know, for, uh, for the VAS, the Vermont Astronomical Society, you know, besides doing all these presentations, you know, various VAS club members will be set up, mostly in their towns, you know, will be set up at our observatory, but, you know, we, we set up, and I'll be, I'm from Williston, so I live in Williston, I'll be set up there. Oh, I believe it. I believe it, yeah. And, and I've, uh, I've actually heard, I forget which, it might have been Delta Airlines was selling tickets for an eclipse flight. So that's kind of a guarantee to be above the clouds. So that would be very cool. So that might be something to do someday if, uh, for a future eclipse. I can only imagine what they're charging for that. I just don't. Yeah, you don't want the aisle seat. Somebody say, yeah. you don't want you want the window seat for in that case. Usually, I get the aisle seat. I'm tall. You know, my legs just don't like that cramped corner. You know, stuck next to the window. Um, yeah, but in this case, I would suffer. I think and take the window. You don't think, uh, just because the people only want the window. Right, just yeah. because people to the window. Right, right. Well, and I guess it would be out one side of the aircraft, too. They might have to have some, uh, <laughs> it'd be interesting. So here's just a, a, a definition of the different, oops, I'm sorry. So. Here's a uh, different, uh, uh, the, the southern border, uh, two minutes here. You know, Waterbury is two minutes and 30 seconds. Morrisville is three minutes. Uh, Burlington is between three minutes 10 and three minutes, I think that says 20. Um, and then three minutes 30 up here, Newport, Milton, um, and uh, same for St. Albans, Enosburg, Swan. They're going to get great, uh, great full eclipse coverage because it's going to be clear. <laughs> so, what causes a solar eclipse? And and again, and then why are they so rare? Um, so, a solar eclipse occurs in its and it's a very small area. So, the the area that the eclipse occurs in is when the sun when the moon gets between the sun and the Earth, and you'd think that happened every day, um, but it doesn't, and, the, and we're gonna talk about the reasons for that. Um, but when you, when you have a full solar eclipse, you're basically in this thing called the umbra, and the umbra is the shadow from the moon. That's that very small point right there, you know, the sun's over here, it's a great big ball, it's shining light, and you get this darkened space, and that's why it's only 115 miles wide. And then this lighter shaded area here, sorry, I'm so shaky. 
this lighter shaded, uh, you're a tough audience, so I'm, I'm, I'm shaking, so. Um, this lighter shaded area here is called the penumbra, and that's where you would see a partial eclipse. So you can see the area of the partial eclipse is much, much larger than the area for the total eclipse. The total eclipse area is very small, this 110 mile stripe that this giant round shadow is flying across the United States at you know, between 1,500 and 4,000 miles an hour. But almost the entire continental USA, or North America, is going to see a partial eclipse. That, that, that um, penumbra is very large. Um, so, an annular eclipse, uh, an annular eclipse, so this is down here, this is the one I got to see in El Dorado, Texas, so um, this occurs, so the moon, besides having to be in the exact position between uh, the sun and the earth, it also has to be at the right distance to get a total solar eclipse, so you've heard of and it, it gets so old for uh, astronomers to hear this, the supermoons. The supermoons are when the moon is just a little bit closer to the Earth. So it, it, it varies, it's not a perfectly circular orbit around the Earth. It varies between 220 approximately and 250,000 miles. When it's at 220,000 miles and it's not a new moon, it's, it's during the, uh, the evening, you get these things called supermoons. They call them supermoons because it's a little closer. It's very hard to perceive that it's actually bigger. At least for me it is, it's very hard to perceive. And then you might get a micromoon when it's at the 250,000 mile distance and you get a full moon in the evening. Um, the eclipses, of course, occur during the day, so we have to have that close moon at 220,000 miles, so it will completely cover um, the sun during our day. And when it doesn't, when it's a little farther away, you get these things called annular eclipses. So this is when everything lines up perfectly, but the moon's farther away, so it, uh, it's a little smaller from our perspective, because it's farther from us, it's closer to the sun, and it doesn't shade the entire sun, and you, get, and you get this. I can tell you, when you get this, you have to keep your glasses on the entire time. You can never take them off, because even when you only have, when you have so much of the sun covered, it's still, it might be a little dimmer outside, a little less bright, but it doesn't look like nighttime, not even close. So it's still very bright out, so it would be very dangerous to look at uh, at the sun during an annular. It was still fun to see it. It was fun to photograph it. Um, it was fun to travel out there. We were on a ranch for that, so we were on a ranch in the middle of old oil fields, like done pumping oil fields um, on, a, uh, on a ranch that does astronomy activity. So it was, uh, it was fun. So here, here's a little more detail of the mechanics of why we don't get this alignment all the time. So there are various angles here. So I'm sure people know that the Earth is tilted. You know, it's, it's, uh, it has an axis that's inclined from the sun. So it's not on the same, you know, it's, in other words, it's not, the axis of the Earth isn't perpendic perpendicular to the, to the uh, to the path around the sun. It's a little inclined, so we're at a tilt, and that's why we get seasons. Um, and I won't go into a lot of that, but that's why you know, we're tilted more towards, uh, the sun is tilted or more strongly towards North America in our summers, and more strongly uh, uh, focused towards the southern hemisphere in our winters. So that's why we get the season. So the moon is also tilted from us. So the moon has an orbit around the earth that is tilted and not in the same plane as the sun. So when the moon is uh, on the side of the sun between the sun and the earth, sometimes it's too high because its orbit is not parallel or it's not parallel to the path between exactly between the path of uh, between the sun and the earth. 
and at other times it's too low. But there are two nodes in these orbits where the mechanics line up. And the moon can be in the right place to cause a, an eclipse. Now, it might not cause a total eclipse because um, you know, if, it's, uh, if it's too far from the Earth, you'll get an annular eclipse. But if it's in that right position, if it's close enough, um, you know, the 220,000 mile uh, uh, point, and it's on one of these two nodes in the orbit, we can end up with a uh, total solar eclipse. Unfortunately, it doesn't land in the same place every time. It, it, uh, it happens uh, all over the Earth. And we're gonna talk about, uh, just real fast here, we have a couple of props. And uh, this is uh, one, of, one of our members, uh, um, I think Jim, Jim's, Jim's wife made this. It's a giant ball of yarn. And this represents the Earth. And Jack has a, uh, a smaller ball. And from a scale perspective, that represents uh, the moon. And we have a string then. How far away oh, yeah. how far? do you think the moon is from the Earth? Any guess? How far should the I scale, be? scale wise, at the scale, how far do you think it should be? Anybody? Closer. Guess? 150,000 miles. Oh, no, I mean in, in the scale. If, if this scale. How far away should I pull this away? Next room. Somebody said, somebody said 20 feet. Okay. Yeah, so. You hold this. Yep. <laughs> there you go to the next one. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Yeah, see you. Bye. <laughs> Anyone else work yet? Yeah. Okay. Here's the distance. Now imagine being in that little spaceship going to the moon. It takes about two, three days to get there. Yep. Oh, now, oh. isn't that cool? And this here shows that five degree angle. So it's either down here or up here. I mean, if this was all in a straight line, you'd have an eclipse, a solar and lunar eclipse every month. Yes. Would be boring. Uh, it would be so cool, right? But that, yeah. But it, but the, but the moon goes in an orbit that goes up and down, so it has to line up perfectly. Thanks, Jack. The sun would be directly straight across from the string. So, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, it would, be a, it would be a ways away. So when we were in Milton this morning, it would have been at the dam. So and I, forget, I don't know exactly how far that is. So a mile and a half is good. OK. So uh, we, we talked about this earlier, 865,000 miles across. Um, we talked about the, uh, the umbra and penumbra um, and the alignment needed, um, you know, the, the orbital uh, mechanics needed for the, uh, the shadow to create a full eclipse on, uh, on the Earth's surface. And that's, that eclipse area is pretty small. If you can see the difference in the shadow there, it's, it's, it's pretty close. It's hard to, a little hard to see, so. It, it goes out over the ocean, and my, my understanding is it ends on the ocean. It doesn't hit another continent. So it goes another, I forget how many, 1,500 miles or so over uh, into the ocean, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, and then uh, stops. So they don't, I guess they don't go on, they don't go on for, uh, you know, across the entire globe. Pardon me? Sunset would be 7.30 maybe at that time or 8 o'clock, so if the sun's going down, then... Oh, of course, you're not going to see it, right, of course. Um, so here's just another picture, um, and it, what it says here is the umbra, that's the, that's the very, that's the totality shadow is never more than 167 miles wide. In this case, we're getting um, a 115 mile wide shadow, and I assume that's a, that's a um, factor with the orbital mechanics and how far the moon actually is away. 
So maybe at the optimal position for us, we would get a 167 uh, mile wide shadow. So it travels very fast. Uh, when it's entering Mexico, it's gonna be 1,500 miles an hour. Um, uh, entering Burlington, it's moving at about 2,500 miles an hour. Uh, leaving Vermont, it's 28, um, 100 miles an hour. And I wanna say somewhere, I guess it's not on the chart, it was gonna be leaving uh, North America at about 4,500 miles an hour, so it's accelerating as it go, goes across the continent. And here's a, and this was an interesting fact I didn't know until this morning either, and that is the eclipses follow similar patterns and they repeat. So if you look here, the 2027 and the 2009 have very similar uh, path uh, shapes, if you will, they're just, uh, they're just uh, not in exactly the same place on the planet because the, the, you know, the alignment of the Earth at the time of the eclipse is a little different than it was, uh, for instance, 2009 to 2027. So you see them repeating all over. You see the 2010 eclipse here, and it's going to happen again, same shape, 2028 over uh, Australia. That might have to be where I am, if, but we're going to have clear skies, so I'm not going to worry about that. So, um, so, and I think the 2024 and then the 2016 here. So anyway, I thought that was very interesting that they have that same. I guess it makes sense given the orbital mechanics are the same. It's just the Earth is in a different spot. The Earth rotation is a different spot when that moon alignment occurs on different years. Uh, where, 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 where. The large green the arc. Yeah. has to do with the size of the map. The map is elongated on the poles. Right. Oh, thank you. You're right. Yeah, yeah. It's a projection of the map. Yeah. What do they call this kind of projection? Mercator, Mercator projection. Thank you. So. I, know, I thought that was interesting. So uh, there must be at least two per year, but there are no more than five. And we get similar solar and lunar eclipses. Um, they repeat a bit more than 18 years, and there's called a sero cycle. Um, and two eclipses separated by one sero cycle are, are similar. And I think that pertains to the, the chart I just showed. You see these similar um, um, occurrences of that same shape of the eclipse path. So this is the thing that I also found interesting, is this, is this next fact. You know, the fact that an eclipse is actually, a, a total eclipse is going over Burlington, you know, over Vermont and in our area, is quite rare. On average, it only happens once every 375 years. It goes over the same spot on the Earth. Now, it can happen a lot closer together. In fact, you'll see in a minute very close together and, and actually happened in a place in, in, uh, in the United States or in North America recently um, where two eclipses occurred seven, two total eclipses occurred um, seven years apart, which was a, a rarity, you know, compared to the average of 375 years. Um, our next partial eclipse is in 2026. Yeah, boring compared, you know, we're gonna have a nice one here. And then the next total eclipse is going to happen on the continental U.S. in um, 2045. That's another 20-some years. So I hope, hope we're going to have clear skies. So um, where to look? Um, well, you need to look to the southwest. So uh, um, the preceding partial phase will be halfway up the sky. It'll be high. So the sun is at a higher point, at about 49 degrees. Totality will be a little lower, about 40 degrees. So you want to have a place where you can see the, you know, when it starts, you want to have some room. So you don't want to have the tree line right below the sun when it starts, because that means when it hits totality, you're not going to see it. So get to a place where there's some, you can see at least um, down to the finish of the, uh, of the uh, partial phase, 30 degrees. That's not that, you know, that's not that difficult to find. So 
Um, and at a minimum, you want to be able to see 40 degrees because you want to see that full total eclipse. And so what to expect on April 8th? So, you know, it'll slightly, it'll uh, slowly dim. And I can tell you for partials, it's very hard to tell. It'll dim a little bit. You'll have a sensation that maybe, you know, a thin cloud's gone over or something. But my understanding is when it hits full, it's like turning off the light switch. And it's turning off the light switch on not entirely dark. It's not going to be like nighttime, but it's going to be maybe like a half an hour after sunset or something. So it's going to go off pretty quick. Uh, you'll feel it change in temperature, of course. Heating is basically turned off. And uh, animals are, will probably be reacting like they do at sunset. You know, birds will be going to roost. You know, they're heading for the trees to, to bed down for the night. So um, I guess it's an interesting thing to experience. I hope uh, we will on, uh, on, uh, on April 8th experience that. So here's just a picture of uh, a bunch of pictures, actually, uh, taken of the eclipse and uh, hitting totality here. And you can see the nice the nice corona, and then uh, heading off. So the moon's actually traveling, in terms of relative, the moon's traveling, everything is traveling west, of course. You know, the moon, the sun, everything travels west across the sky because we're spinning in the opposite direction. We're spinning counterclockwise as an Earth. Um, but the moon is, is relative to the sun is traveling this way, you know, traveling east, relative to the position of the sun. And that's why it's leaving on um, the west side here. So, okay. And here's a photo, a set of photos, a collage of photos done by one of our members for the 2017 eclipse. And here's something called Bailey's beads. And I'm running, uh, tell me if I'm in trouble for time. No, you're not. Okay, all right. <laughs> Go 10 minutes, leave a little time for Q&A. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, we're almost done. So this is called Bailey's Beads. So you know the surface of the moon isn't entirely flat. There are mountain ranges. There are um, um, lots of craters. So that gives you a features on the, uh, like a surface feature, uh, features on the moon. So when the, when the sun gets to the point or the moon gets to the point where it's basically eclipsing the sun. In some place, places it will eclipse it, in some places not. It's like peeking through the trees as it gets to the final edge because there are mountain ranges and crater ridges and that. And when that sun peeks through those places, like peeking through a fence or through the trees, um, it creates these things called Bailey's beads. And this was the gentleman that I guess named those, that, uh, that phenomena back in, uh, in the 17, 1770s to 18, uh, 1800s. And here's a picture of something called the diamond ring effect. So this is when the sun, this happens twice during a total eclipse. It happens once when the sun um, first, uh, first starts to cover, is almost completely covering, uh, when the moon almost completely covers the sun. You get that last glint of full sunlight. This is before, actually, Bailey's beads. Bailey's beads are kind of at the very end. So they call this the diamond ring. And then you get the full, this is totality. So that you get this, um, you can see the corona. And like I said, this, this will go out one, two, I don't know, three or so uh, diameters of the sun out from the sun. So it's uh, quite a, quite a um, spectacular effect. Here's another picture, and this is from one of our uh, um, VAS members from 2017. So this is a, a quick picture. So it's not nighttime in this picture. This is actually the, the map of the sky during the day. The, it's, it's just black for purposes of seeing. But uh, um, somewhere on here is the sun. And it's going to be black because it's covered. Oh, it's right here. So we get the sun here, we've got Venus here, and Jupiter here. We think when you're, we're having the full eclipse, you'll actually see those two planets. You'll be able to see Jupiter and Venus because they're both, you know, Venus is the, the brightest planet, and Jupiter would be the next brightest planet. We think you're gonna see both of those. 
There's also a small chance you could see a comet. There's a comet up here, and I can't see it from where I'm standing, but it's, uh, it's Pons Brooks, it's 12P Pons Brooks. There's a chance if it brightens up some, we might actually see a comet also. So it's very cool, but don't waste your time looking for it. If it isn't obvious, you know, <laughs> enjoy the full eclipse. So safe solar viewing, um, you know, never look at the sun directly um, um, without solar glasses. You can look at it indirectly by projection. Uh, any pinhole, I talked about this earlier, you can use household utensils, all kinds of things to make pinholes. Um, here's one, just a, some, some holes punched into um, a piece of cardboard and, and shined onto a white piece of paper. Here's one that Jack did, I think, for the 2017 eclipse, yep. partial eclipse. And, uh, um, you know, we're punching out VAS and little, little pinholes and uh, getting them projected on a piece of paper. People were doing that in El Dorado. It was fun. People were walking around with those things. Anything that will make a pinhole uh, projection will do that. So another example, um, through trees as well. You know, if you get gaps between the leaves and a tree, I don't know if we're going to have any leaves in April, but the, that would, uh, if it was later in the year, you would see that. Those are very cool. People can make these pinhole boxes. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to do this to view the eclipse indirectly, so you're not looking directly at it. Uh, a safer, even safer than using the glasses, of course. Um, you can have your head in a box. <laughs> there's different ways to do it. You know, the, the last one just had a hole offset over here and looking from the outside, but you can do it from the inside too. Just don't, uh, just don't climb any stairs while, uh, while looking at the eclipse with the box on your head. So, um, and of course, safety solar glasses. And the thing about the solar glasses, um, whoops, is they, they should have an ISO rating on them. So when they're good solar glasses, they have an ISO rating on them. And we have the numbers in the presentation. They're also on our eclipse viewers, those ISO ratings. You want to make sure they're rated. Here's a picture of things that people can use. We do not recommend using these welder's glasses. My understanding, they don't, um, they don't protect against a certain kind of radiation. I think it's UV radiation. And uh, so we don't recommend those. All of these other things are safe as long as they have the ISO rating. We, we, again, we, we don't recommend welder's glasses. Here's a picture of uh, the VAS viewers. And, you know, Again, the partials, both coming and going, you have to wear the glasses or use an indirect, use the box. And then um, the full, you take the glasses off. And typically during eclipses, there will be a caller. I'll be doing that in Williston, on the Williston Green, I'll be calling out, you know, glasses on, glasses off. Um, somebody should be doing that and timing it because you don't want to uh, end up looking at the sun when it peaks, uh, peaks back through. And here's the ISO rating. And so don't use ordinary sunglasses, you know, anything that doesn't have that ISO rating. Not smoked, not smoked glass, you know, uh, not photographic or x-ray film, no space blankets, potato chip bags, DVDs, aluminum foils. <laughs> They're all not, none of those are safe and not welder's glass. So, and here's just a picture of a bunch of people looking at a partial solar eclipse. And again, they've got, uh, you put the, um, the filters on the front of any magnifying optics, that's important. Don't put glasses on, don't put eclipse glasses on and then look through a pair of binoculars because that light will be focused by the binoculars, it'll burn a hole into that uh, film and you will hurt your eyes terribly. So it always has to be before the optic. So on the front of a telescope, on the front of a pair of binoculars, uh, not on the back end, that would not protect you. That light uh, uh, is very strong when it's magnified, even a little bit. I'm sure as kids, you've all taken the magnifying glass with light and on a leaf and it burns it quickly, so. And here's a telescope with a filter on it. And that's, 
And that's it. So I'm sorry I went long. I, I guess I'm a long talker. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, they're both dangerous. I mean, they're both. It is damaging to your eyes, but I, I would tell you that at the end of the eclipse, so at the end of totality, your pupils are going to be a little uh, dilated, right? They're going to be bigger. So when that light first peeks out and is very bright, that would be more damaging than when your pupils are very uh, small, right? So. Oh, go ahead. Okay. You, you know more. Uh, even before the eclipse, when your eyes, uh, pupils are the normal size for brightness, it's still dangerous to look at the sun. Even 99% yes. partial, it's dangerous to look at. It. It's got to be completely covered. You, know, you can see the Bailey's beads if, if that's possible, but I would not. The reason is, if you look at the sun, you attempt to look at the sun, you'll, you'll immediately look, look away. Okay, that, that's happened to me any number of times. You look at a village and say, it's very bright. You know. But the temptation is, if you're looking at an eclipse, to look at it. And that's, you've got to avoid that. That's the point. Yeah, it's, uh, so, so yeah, don't look at the sun at any time uh, without some protection. Yes? Did you bring in, are there any handouts with some of these tips, like look toward the southwest and too dark? Um, well, we don't have that, but you can just go to the eclipse2024.org website that you can actually look up Vermont for the timing, the direction, um, and of course you'll see, it's going to be clear, so you're welcome. It'll be clear, so you'll see the sun rising, so, and you'll, uh, I believe it's the partial starts around, uh, I forget now, around two, two something. So, yes. Uh, if you're not watching a, website, a caller, um, is there any app or anything? They're, they're absolutely, it's called the uh, Eclipse Timer. Oh, Eclipse Timer. Yeah, it's the Eclipse Timer and it's a great app. Okay. And uh, I've, I'm actually going to use it because what it, it actually, it, it calls out announcements from your phone. So you, you basically start the app, you put it down and it, it does um, audio cues. It says, you know, glasses on, glasses off. Yes. So, and what's in, it called again? in the eclipse eclipse timer. Yes. Does it make sense to go uh, on top of a mountain like one of Washington? Um, I imagine it would be uh, if if they're in the to and they're in the path. I don't know if they're in the path. It's going farther north after Vermont, so I, I don't think they would be in the path. Be in the be in the path of totality. Yeah. Back in the uh, early nineties. Oh yeah, yeah. They happen pretty frequently too. Yeah, yeah. Those are interesting. That's when the moon turns basically red. Yeah, it's very cool. I've taken pictures of those. Never the total. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Absolutely. If you go out a week or five days or seven days ahead, that's the approximate position. So you're going to know where the sun is at the time of the eclipse. Just make sure it's clear and make sure you get that view from the start to the finish of the eclipse. Yes. Won't change much in a week. What uh, was that app Eclipse timer. It's on, it's on Android and, uh, and Apple. Well, it depends. So during totality, no filters needed. You can take pictures. The brightness of the of the corona is only about the brightness of a full moon. So it's you, know, you can easily take pictures of the moon, as you know. So, but during uh, partial, you absolutely need filters. Um, you should use a filter. Yeah. Are we, so we have a, we're going to have a session on April 1st, a week before. You know, we meet the Monday, uh, the first Monday of every month. In this case, April 1st is on a Monday. 
Um, we're going to be talking about eclipse photography and viewing the eclipse and what we're going to be doing on that date. So that would be a date to call in. I don't think we have any practice sessions of, uh, but there's a lot of YouTube videos out there to give you an idea of what to do. So are you talking about with a lens, uh, a SLR or with an iPhone or? Either an SLR or a telescope. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, for, uh, for photographing the eclipse, something between, um, if you have a telescope, something a little wide angle, because you want to get at least three diameters of the sun away from the sun for the entire um, corona, if you want to get the whole thing. Um, so I've seen recommendations four, five, six, seven hundred millimeters, but not much more than that okay. for a telescope. So 400 would be perfect, it sounds, yeah. And if you can plug an SLR into the back, um, yeah, and you can practice ahead of time. So, and my understanding is the, uh, is the filtered, so this is, uh, depends on the filter you're using. If you're going to take pictures before totality, you'll need a filter on your scope because you don't, you know, you'll cook something because you're magnifying the light. Um, the, the exposure for, through the filter is about the same as the exposure for the corona afterwards. So the, you know when you when you have total when you have totality it's about the same as the filtered light. That's going to depend on your filter. I just I just uh, had seen that recently, so I we'll, we'll have to see. My exposure at, at ISO 100 for a, for the partial through the filter was one one eight hundredths of of a second at f7. My scope was an f7. So if that gives you any idea, yeah, yeah. 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 I think you would see it. You would fly through the if you flew through the shadow, you would have to fly under the shadow. So it can't. Be, the path is only activated when the shadow goes over it, and it's going over it very fast. So you would have to fly over the exact intersection of the shadow moving across that path. Oh, you would, of course, yeah, yeah. Yes? You, you, well, you need solar filters, so, so you can get them from B&H Photo, Amazon sells them, um, B&H Photo, um, Agena, Astro, um, many places, and that's a popular thing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>